All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming out. It's good to actually get back out after being cranked up uh, for a while. But uh, today we're going to talk about uh, using uh, key performance indicators to achieve uh, supply chain management optimization. And this is a actual ongoing case study from uh, Loma Linda University Medical Center uh, located out in California. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, this used to be the boring conversation in the room, but ever since uh, the wonderful world of the pandemic as we know it, it is now the popular conversation to have in the room uh, as far as uh, supply chain optimization and supply chain management uh, is concerned. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the two components. I work for DMED. DMED is the company that, uh, that embarked on this journey with Loma Linda to uh, manage supply chain with them. Uh, we are a some part as a service-based organization uh, that is dedicated to managing the supply chain uh, revolution or the supply chain cycle all the way from the manufacturer to the uh, point of care in the hospital system. And uh, we'll show you how we achieve that at Loma Linda University and talk about uh, the numbers and the culture, uh, which was the biggest thing that changed at the uh, setting over there. So a little bit about our, wow. Let's get back there. A little bit about Loma Linda University Medical Center, which was our uh, partner in this project. They're a 507 bed academic medical center uh, located in Loma Linda or San Bernardino County, in California, uh, Seventh day Adventist, uh, six hospital system. They have over 1.5 million in annual outpatients, the only level one trauma center for the region that covers more than 25% of the state of California's level one trauma. They're named the best hospital in 2018 and 19 and the high performance in seven areas by US News and World Report. The medical center and East Campus were also awarded an A for patient safety from the LeapFrog Group's uh, safety grade. And they're the leading regional heart and vascular center throughout the International uh, Heart Institute's ratings. Uh, you'll see that the study that we can, or the uh, optimization started with the cardiovascular lab. Uh, we'll get into why in a little bit, but that's usually where the highest ticket dollar items are located. Uh, so we'll get into there. What were the challenges that Loma Linda was looking to solve? How are we trying to do that? Uh, they're trying to treat higher patient acuity and they're going to hone in on their supply costs. Uh, they're going to try and perform more complex procedures, which are going to lead to the need for much more complex supplies and the ability to keep those supplies, try and maximize their procedure length and uh, maximize their clinical resources. Uh, they needed to do that at lower costs. How are they going to do that at lower costs? They're going to hopefully lower the cost of their total inventory. They're going to ensure that their purchases align with their needs, not have a bunch of waste uh, on hand. They're going to ensure accurate charge capture and billing, a very big challenge in today's day and age, and we'll explain how that got maximized or optimized as we go through this. And they needed to get some clinical resources to do non-clinical work, something that we never want to see in the hospital setting. Uh, you know, nurses, doctors, and all that are responsible for patient care. Uh, but they were doing non-patient care related activities with relation with when it comes to managing supplies and things like that. So we needed to take that out of the clinical staff's hands, allow them to focus on patient care, and allow supply chain to do their job as far as maximizing supplies. And they needed to achieve some excellent outcomes. They needed to reduce the unnecessary variation in utilization. We'll look at some performance indicators in there, but for example, they had some supplies that like supplies that they carry from seven different vendors in one, in one particular instance. And they were able to group those together, figure out which was their two greatest spends, and ensure their best cost, et cetera, which we'll get to when we get to the numbers, because you'll see some very interesting numbers with respect to that. They needed to ensure that they had accurate data in their patient records. We're going to show you some pretty alarming uh, statistics and some pretty alarming uh, paperwork when we get to patient records and charge capture. Uh, they need to solve a problem that I have seen throughout a lot of uh, hospitals that I have visited and worked with in the past is that no expired product is placed in a patient unless medically necessary. The thing you would say is, when does that happen? You'd be surprised how often that happens. Uh, and they needed to ensure that in, in the event that there was a recall, that they had an ability to manage that recall in a swift and efficient manner. A lot of people I talk to before they become customers of, of VMEDS 
don't even know how to look for lot numbers that are affected when recalls occur and things like that uh, without having a solution in place. And many times don't even know if they're affected by recalls for products. So we established a project with Loma Linda. That project had four goals. Number one was to gain full visibility and control over the supply and spend. Number two was to optimize the inventory size and composition to meet the clinical need. Number three was to reduce the unnecessary products variations that they had, and number four was to ensure comprehensive and accurate charge capture. Some four pretty robust uh, goals to go on. Let's see if this works better. This. Yes. How did we do that? Uh, we implemented the Uduma uh, cloud system, uh, and that is going to track everything from the point of delivery, so at the, at the loading dock, all the way to the point of care, full integration with their supply chain systems, full integration with their uh, clinical documentation systems, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, where all the data goes from point of receipt to the point of care, managed through one centralized system to ensure that the best outcome was reached for the facility. They did that utilizing something called uh, UHF RFID. Uh, UHF RFID was installed throughout the cath lab. Uh, this is actually the uh, blueprint of the cath lab. Uh, it's passive UHF RFID uh, system that was installed that would track the supplies movement from. Uh, its storage locations throughout the lab uh, into the procedure room and report that movement and ultimately utilization into the clinical documentation system. Some pictures of the actual installation. The uh, UHF antennas are the items located on the ceiling there. You see look like uh, Wi-Fi beacons. Uh, they were installed inside of the supply rooms uh, throughout the hallways, as you see in the middle. Inside some of the supply cabinets that they had uh, of bulk of items and ultimately in the procedure rooms at the area where uh, supplies will be consumed and managed. So, the first question. Yep. Why would you have the wireless access point? Because of the fact that there was a lot of supply in the Loma Linda scenario that was not stored in the supply room, they suffer from a lack of space. They have a very old facility they're building a new medical center as we speak uh, which will hopefully encompass that but they have a lot of stuff that was located out in the halls unfortunately in carts because of the lack of supply rooms they had a lot of stuff that was in the procedure rooms they had a lot of stuff that left the supply room for a case was never used but never made its way back to the supplier uh, so you have a lot of stuff that uh, you'll see when we go through there that this was considered waste that was gone but it was really in the procedure room in the cabinet that somebody had placed back long, long ago and long forgotten that it was there. Uh, so that's why they decided to do the full elimination drop. Another part of it is they took the solution end to end. So they added asset tracking capabilities. So they went from supplies all the way to tracking assets. So the infrastructure was already in place and they could use the same uh, network to track their assets as well uh, using the same RFID network. So they have a full end to end uh, system. So how did you define no, they actually have a, a point of care station where they would scan the devices in. There's a, a actual barcode scanner. It's also an RFID uh, reader. They put the supply over as they were using. It would enter Epic as the uh, clinical documentation system that they use there. It would transfer the supply into Epic with its full UDI data, lot number, expiration date. Serial, if applicable, all that directly into the patient's medical record without the clinical staff doing a thing as far as data entry is concerned. Uh, so that's how they, they would uh, decrement the guidance. Mm -hmm. So, in order to get to that, there was a lot of realignment and uh, redefinition of roles and responsibilities. So, they had to collect, set up a clearly defined daily, weekly, monthly set of protocols for all inventory related activities, something that never existed. At Loma Linda prior to this implementation. Uh, they needed to set up an accurate process for audit auditing and reordering, uh, receiving and restocking, expiration management, and item data management. And all that needed to be collaborated and coordinated with three different departments. 
supply chain, IT, and finance. Because whether they choose to admit it or not, they're all integrated with each other because without uh, IT support, there's no uh, installation or maintenance of this equipment. Finance gives supply chain the, the purse strings to buy the stuff. So if the three aren't talking to each other, none of them uh, get to an outcome that is uh, desired by any of them. So that was the realignment that needed to take place with regards to uh, that. They needed to reallocate some resources. Uh, they had to standardize their inventory management activities across two interventional departments, four locations, three facilities, and they had one person doing that at Loma Linda uh, up until uh, we got involved. Uh, they had to reorganize their inventory management staff and move supply chain uh, activities between cross train departments. And they had to have uh, leadership oversight, which was an agreed upon set of key performance indicators, which we're gonna get to at the end of this uh, presentation that you'll see some pretty interesting numbers there. And they had to establish accountability for following through the desired objectives. It was really the, the front of the bus didn't know what the back of the bus was doing most of the time as far as uh, supplies were concerned in the cap lab. The supply chain folks were managing it. Uh, the cardiovascular lab assumed that they had the supplies they needed. And when that failed, it was a blame game, uh, which is what they were looking to avoid here going forward to uh, how they could optimize that and know the supplies they have on hand on a continuous basis. What are the results so far? This process kicked off uh, four years ago, uh, but they have full visibility for each item uh, from requisition to billing. So they know the moment an item is ordered, all the way to the moment it's shipped from the manufacturer, received at the facility, in their supply room, now all into the procedure room, used in a case, and ultimately billed to the patient. Uh, they have an automated process, uh, procedure to pay process. There's no uh, billing clerks running around uh, looking for nurses to give them charge capture information or what was used in a case or was this a seven or was this a two? Uh, how many of these were used? All of that is an automated process currently. They streamlined their operations. We did a little experiment with regards to people at Loma Linda also, and just in the cardiovascular lab, based on what we questioned the gentleman asked earlier with regards to supplies not being in the centralized supply location and throughout the cath lab, this is a six uh, cath lab uh, site at Loma Linda. Nurses were on average out of the procedure room seven to nine minutes per procedure looking for supplies throughout various different labs, hallways, et cetera. So that's seven to nine minutes that they were away from the patient. In the event that something happened, there was nobody in the room. They were out looking for a catheter or a sheet or something like that, and no one was in there taking care of the patient. Obviously, that was something that needed to be addressed. They aligned their purchases with consumption needs. There's always the situation, especially in healthcare, that supplies get hoarded especially when uh, nurses feel the need that something is going to uh, become short-staffed or short-stocked. They tend to hide the stock levels that they need or uh, ensure that they have the stock levels they need because they don't want to be yelled at by doctors. We have doctors that need special uh, supplies or felt that they needed special supplies. Uh, that will be addressed when we get down here. And recall management used to take them probably two to three months to figure out whether something was implanted in a patient and a, a recall management letter came out uh, from the manufacturer. Now they can do that in a matter of minutes. All they have to do is enter the appropriate lot number into our system and it sell them down to the patient, whether that lot A was used, consumed, whether they have it on hand uh, and whether they need to address whether it needs to be removed. There, how did we do that? Uh, we're gonna get to that in a minute uh, or down the road. But their inventory value by the numbers is really unchanged. We didn't touch the total volume of their inventory. We'll get to that as we go through this. Their case volume is really unchanged. Their expiring inventory is down to about 1% of their total stock, a number that is superbly uh, good for a supply chain uh, and lab of their size. Their excess inventory was reduced by 60% out of this study so far. Their cost per case has increased by 97%, I guess. I have so much.
And what do I mean by their cost per case is increased by 97%? They were leaving 97% of their revenue on the table. They did not bill for 97% of billable supply on average prior to this uh, collaboration between the two of us. Their billing accuracy is now greater than 90%. It used to be about 12% billing accuracy. Uh, and their insurance reimbursement uh, prior to us starting was somewhere in the single digits uh, with regards to accuracy and the amount of reimbursement they got due to uh, billing errors. So here are the metrics. The first metric that we attacked was expiration control because it's the most uh, compounding or overwhelming statistic that we can show immediately once we implement this process. It's something that we do on a monthly basis, and we look at the expiring products as a percentage of the total on-hand inventory. We do that by looking at the individual SKUs, the total units, and the total value. When we go into the lab and we do an inventory after the system was processed, we always ask, what do you think you have as far as expired stock on hand? And the always the answer is, oh, we don't have hardly anything on hand as far as expired. We're really good about that. We check every month. We go around the lab and, and uh, our supply chain clerk goes into the room and he looks and sees what's expired. Well, we're going to show you some pretty interesting numbers. Let me show you the, the beginning uh, inventory and the current inventory on hand with regards to expired. The second thing that they needed to tackle was inventory size reduction. How do they do that? Monthly, they agreed to look at their inventory on hand related to case volumes. We're going to look at those numbers when we get there. Again, we address that by total SKUs, total units, and the total volume. And secondly, they took a look at their unused or infrequently used supplies in the last 12 months as a percentage of the total on-hand inventory. And you'll see some pretty alarming numbers there as far as what was deemed unused or infrequently used that was just sitting on the shelf, ultimately expiring because a long, long time ago, somebody brought those products in for one case that never took off or one type of procedure that never took off. And that stock was continuously reordered because it was something they had, but not utilized. There are some, unfortunately, that are necessary to have and that will expire uh, just because it's the nature of uh, healthcare that they have to have these supplies on hand in the event of an adverse situation that takes place during a the procedure. They have to have some of these uh, supplies on hand. The reality is they never use them. Suppliers have this great deal with those stock but they don't take it back and they make you rebuy it. Uh, so that's a great, uh, great business to be in if you want to do that uh, with regards to that uh, particular situation in the cardiovascular lab. Uh, the third thing they took a look at was the reduction in product purchases. So they took a look at the purchases versus the consumption. Pretty simple metric to take a look at. But they took that at a third level, which is in relation to case volume. So they took a look at their total consumed versus purchase history and, and divided that into the number of cases that were done on a monthly basis. Again, filtering it down to the SKU level, to the total units and the total value uh, for the supplies used in that period of time. And then on a quarterly basis, they take a look at the on-hand value of items above suggested par levels. Another part of the process that was implemented was a suggested par level uh, for each item. And really believing and really adhering to the par level even though it may look like a strange number, getting the supply chain folks and getting the cardiovascular lab staff to really believe the numbers are correct because it's a algorithm that is based off of the calculation that's done on the reports based on the unit and values that we see above. And you need to understand and comprehend that if it said four, four is far, you don't need eight. Uh, whether it feels good to have eight on hand, I understand, but you really only need four because the goal is to turn the inventory as frequently as possible. And clinical utilization management, uh, there was a culture change that needed to take place with regards to physicians uh, and things of that nature, which dealt with open, not used products and average open, not used products per case. There was a big cultural change that needed to take place with their physicians at this uh, Loma Linda facility was that they brought everything into a case, they opened it all up, and then they used one of them and they threw away the other nine because they just wanted to have everything open in the event that they were going to use it during the case, as opposed to let's have it in the room and open it as we need it, uh, not as 
to the uh, just open everything up and throw away what we don't use at the end. And then they did a little exercise called cost for each type of case per position. They took the same procedure, so apples to apples comparison. They put all the doctors in a pile uh, with our reporting feature, and they did an analysis of how many, how, how their cost per case was. It started out that we had one on the bottom, one at the top. We looked at the middle ground. The middle ground was way, way different than the top and the bottom. Once the doctors knew that they were being tracked as far as cost per case was concerned, within a matter of four months, they were all within three dollars of each other as far as spending. Once they knew that his brother was, was watching for per se. Uh, but we had doctors that were thousands of dollars apart doing the same exact procedures just because one liked using Boston Scientific, the other liked using Abbott. The other doctor refused to do a case if he didn't have a Abbott product, where the other six used Boston Scientific products. So it was a culture change to establish with with uh, the staff at Loma Linda that led to numbers. Exploration management, that's the first thing we talked about there. Here are some real graphs from when we started this project back in 2018. So they had owned expiring inventory within 90 days. Uh, when we first started in April of 2018, it was okay. You'll see the trend here of the number is going down, which is a nice which is a nice trend for them, uh, but they removed expired inventory in excess of $27,000 in the first uh, six months that we did this project. Uh, and they kept their expiring inventory number, as you can see, when it peaked in January, they had $65,000 of inventory that was at risk of expiring in 2019 in January. And they've taken that number down to $8,130 at risk of expiring in March. So in three months, they took their, their inventory from just shy of $65,000 at risk of expiring to $8,000 at risk of expiring just by running reports, understanding what's expiring, and either getting credit from the vendor for a new piece of equipment, using the equipment that's going to be expiring as opposed to just taking the first one they find on the shelf, uh, which was common there. They reorganized their stock. They labeled their stock with stickers on there that would indicate that this is first to use uh, as opposed to they just, just take the first one they find off the shelf. And they got their expired materials down over $60,000 in, in a period of just under three months in 2019. And that first this is an interesting uh, method to take a look at. <laughs> Their unused inventory reduction. This is where the numbers get really, really interesting. In 2018, they had probably about 1,148 items, uh, just to be exact, of unused stock. They're currently down 347 items uh, this year, or 2019. Uh, of owned inventory that's not or unused. What did that unused inventory come from? From what we said, they had five vendors providing the same exact item or the same type of item. They leveraged their two highest vendors, contracted with those two highest vendors to maximize their price and got rid of the other three. And they saved not only money, but they reduced their unused inventory dramatically. Uh, in that respect. So there's no need to carry six uh, widgets from five different vendors. They can narrow it down to their top two and leverage their price with the top two vendors uh, to maximize their cost for the goods and to minimize their unused inventory. With regards to money, when we first started, that unused inventory well was valued at $738,210. 2019, that value is down to $273,000. So savings of half a million dollars in a short period of time by leveraging contracts and maximizing uh, the use of inventory or, or uh, the unused inventory, keeping par levels set, adhering to those par levels, making sure that if it says you need four, not to order seven, if you need four, four is the number, 
and he turned them faster, and they use them faster, and they keep them in stock that way. Purchases versus consumed inventory, which is the, the number that finance always likes to look at. Their case volume back in 2018 when we first started, started at about anywhere from 300 cases a month to topping out at probably about 400, just shy of 400 cases a month. And the revenue cost was about $2 million in 2018. Uh, that was what they claimed their revenue cost was in 2018, based off of their uh, numbers. In 2019, just from January to May, so the first five months of the year, their revenue cost went up to $3,289,000. That wasn't because uh, their cases went up. As you can see, their cases are pretty flat. Were pretty the same in 2019 as they were from 2018. We were just able to bill for more supplies or stuff that they realized that they had not left uh, on the table. Another significant uptick in the amount of money that they have available to them or, or bill that was able to get there. Uh, their consumed inventory is pretty much on par at this time now with their caseload. It used to be that their consumed inventory was way up here or I'm sorry, their consumed inventory was way on the bottom and their caseload was way, way up top. And they had a lot of stuff left over on the shelves. There are times now where their consumed inventory exceeds their case volume on a monthly basis. As, as illustrated in April of 2019, their consumed inventory was more than their, their total uh, caseload, which is good. They want to get their inventory out. They want to use their inventory. They want to maximize their inventory on hand. And they want to be able to turn that inventory on a recurring basis, maximize their billing potential for it, and maximize their reimbursement for it. Unnecessary waste and consumption. We started out in 2018 where they had anywhere from nine on average units wasted a month to as high as almost 30 units wasted in a period of time and then 2019 rolled around and they got they started the year out well then they went back and started wasting a lot more but you can see that that waste translates into $35,000 of supply that was wasted in one month but they have these metrics now they have these numbers they can action on these numbers they went from wasting $1,500 a month to in two months wasting over $50,000, close to $60,000. So what happened in those two months? Well, they have the data now that they can analyze that, they can action upon that data, and they can understand why they got to that number. And in this particular case, this was items that were open, not used. And these were two positions that were utilizing an enormous amount of product that was not used in a case. And when the analysis was done, they were no longer employed. Level one, they took the action that they didn't need those positions there, and they found a couple other positions to do the same uh, procedures there at the facility because they didn't understand the or they refused to comply with the culture that one one was putting in place with regards to inventory management and supply management. So, as long as they have the data, the data, the data doesn't lie, the data is actionable, the data is useful to them, the data gets their, their attention, uh, they're able to provide those physicians with the data. And how did we get there? And that's how we got there. We had some lessons that were learned, obviously. The first and most important lesson that was that we needed to engage all the key stakeholders early in the process. We had to have everybody's understanding, everybody's cooperation to be on board with regards to the process and to the, and to the uh, culture that was taking place. And we had to maximize the resource availability, which was done here. We staggered the implementation I ability not to coincide with other major projects. Finance always liked when projects are taken in, in stages or in chunks as opposed to a huge outlay of capital in the beginning. Uh, and then they uh, bundle up with other major projects. The major project at Loma Linda is they're building a whole new hospital next door to their existing hospital. So cash was tight. So they had to understand how to uh, implement this and stagger that implementation 
without uh, overwhelming or breaking the bank. We have to establish a baseline starting point to measure progress from there. We took day one, that was the baseline. We took an inventory on day one. Whatever the result of that inventory was, it was, that was the baseline. And the goal was to improve the process from that point forward. We had to ensure that administrative and position leadership committee supported commitment and support. And they, we had that from day one. Uh, one of the big things that the director of the uh, uh, CAP lab at Loma Linda was pleased is that at his fingertips, he had access to reports and he could run reports by vendor. He could run reports by position. He could run reports by cases. He could run reports by types of products. And he had this data immediately. It was data that had to be filtered or processed by uh, IT and given back to him 10 days from when he requested or whatever. He had access to this data on a continuous, immediate basis where he could run the numbers, get the analysis, get the key KPIs that we showed you, an action upon those KPIs. We had to build strong collaboration and get support from supply chain. That was easy. Once we told supply chain that we were going to maximize their inventory turn, that was going to do two things. It was going to alleviate their space problem because we maximized uh, supply chain management. We weren't ordering as many of stuff, so we had better organization, better place to store it. We maximized where things were located and how they were located to minimize nurses having to leave the procedure room on a recurring basis to find stuff. It was organized in a system where they could look up an item and it would tell them where the item was, as opposed to running around the entire lab looking to where did we leave, where did we last recall having these items stored. Uh, so it was a, a process in place. Supply chain obviously liked the fact that they have to reorder less since we maximize the supply chain turn, they store less, they reorder less, but they reorder on a more frequent level, which is good. It keeps their costs down because they're utilizing it as they're reordering it. So it's a in and out in a, as opposed to an in that sits there for six months to a year and then maybe we'll bill it. Uh, we had to establish clear roles and responsibilities and accountabilities. Like we said, there had to be cooperation from supply chain all the way to the clinical staff all the way to physicians, all the way to administration. And they had to understand that the data was the data and the data was going to drive the decisions. And we had the oversight mechanisms and performance expectations with supporting data and KPIs. Decisions weren't going to be made off the whim. They weren't going to be made off of the thoughts. They were going to be made off of the KPIs that we just showed uh, there for, for that situation. And like we said, it's led to the maximization of their supply chain uh, stock. It's led to the maximization of their supply turn. Uh, they're close to, I came from the retail inventory business, and I was shocked when I went into the healthcare inventory business. Uh, in retail inventory, they're pretty good about turning their stock on a pretty recurring basis. Uh, in the healthcare market, that's almost unheard of, turning their stock on a regular basis. Uh, they buy a lot of stuff. And it generally just sits there until they need to use it. We needed to change the culture. We changed the culture at Loma Linda where they buy, use, buy, use on a constant basis. They're not short supplies. That was the first hurdle that we had to get over was the, was the fear that they were not going to have the inventory they needed when they needed it. Once they started to believe the numbers, once they started to believe the, the utilization numbers, and supply numbers, they understood that they were not going to be short stock unless something dramatic occurred and they could adjust and they needed to understand that they could turn that inventory they have got to do their well oiled machine now where they, they order, they use, they replenish, and the process starts all over again. And they're, they're very good at it and they have their stuff down to a small supply room. Out of the hallways, they were also getting all kinds of regulatory compliance issues for having carts in hallways, stuff outside of hallways. <clears throat> when they get the wonderful visit from Jayco and they want to know why there's carts in the hallway blocking access to beds, rolling around and stuff like that, and their answer is, well, we don't have any place to put this. Regulatory agencies do not understand that answer or do not like that answer, and they uh, issue fines for that type of thing. We got that taken care of as well because we maximized their space. What could be done in the future? 
virtual case cards. These are just examples of what you can do with the with the data once they have it. Supply demand planning based on schedule cases. Predictive analysis of what's going to be used based on the type of procedure is something that they can maximize now that they have this data or this key performance indicator data available to them at a moment's notice. They can analytically predict what's going to be used in any particular case by any particular position and be proactive about having that stock available. They can use a standardized bill of materials for each type of procedure, which is what Loma Linda is gravitating towards doing now. They want to say for this type of procedure, this is the list of supplies, regardless of who the physician is. This is the standardized bill of materials. And if something specialized is needed, then that physician would make a request uh, to supply chain through the IHI director at Loma Linda, and you'll see if those specialized products will be accepted into this standardized bill of materials. By having this standardized bill of materials leads to what we've discussed up to this point. They can turn inventory on a much faster basis because it's all standardized. They can get the best price for goods because they're ordering from two vendors instead of six. And they've leveraged those contracts saying that if we buy everything from you, what's our price? Or what's going to be our price if we choose to use you guys exclusively? And they're able to leverage that. Number two is an ongoing exploration management program, something very important. It's proactive view and management of expiring inventory. They look about the 25th of each month, they run a report that tells them what's going to expire at the conclusion of that month. The list tells them what they have on hand that's going to expire, where it's located, because of RFID, they're able to tell them where it's sitting. And in less than an hour, these guys in the supply chain can go out, address the stuff that's going to expire, either move it to the front of the list, if they know it's an item that is used on a recurring basis or a frequent basis, or if it's an item that is truly going to expire because there are items that are truly going to expire, they're not going to be used, they can proactively pull it. They can contact the manufacturer before it expires and either get a replacement for something uh, for that same item with a future expiration date, or they can get credit for the item before it's too late. Because a lot of these manufacturers, A, will not take it back after it expires, or B, they will take it back after it expires but they'll start docking you the value of the item based on the time since its expiration and when you contacted them for a credit, up to 90 days generally. After 90 days, you ate it uh, in most cases, but they're able to get the stuff out, exchange and or return for credit before it expires, ensuring the maximum value for the items. Predictive analysis. Another thing that you can do based on the cake guys, it's something the Loma Linda does very well now, is they can anticipate and sense the demand using accurate consumption data. They can optimize their inventory carrying costs. They can proactively offer viable alternatives in case of recalls and back orders. I've seen a lot of back orders uh, managed with, with Loma Linda. They're very good at providing a solution for the back orders. There's stuff that is back ordered six months sometimes, there's, and especially in the cardiac uh, department where this was started. There's stuff that's back ordered indefinitely. Uh, so they're very good about being able to find a comparable solution and ordering a comparable solution for the product based on their list of suppliers, based on their history of product, and based on their consumption values for that. Other predictive analysis. Well, we're living the greatest predictive analysis right now, which is the area of COVID-19 and where supply is going to be in short notice, where we're going to need to stock up on stuff. We're going to take a look at a graph that I drew in here uh, based on where they sit today and where they sat the last uh, three or four months based on the pandemic and how they address the pandemic with regards to their KPIs. Recall management, uh, not only for stock purposes, to get the recall products off the shelf if they have them, and return to the vendor in exchange for viable product, the patient notification. So they're, a, they're able to instantly track the status of a recalled item and its location in the supply chain. 
like I said, if it's on the shelf or in a room somewhere, they can find that instantly. They can go out, they can address it, pull it off the shelf, return it to the manufacturer, get a new one. And also, if the item was ultimately used in a procedure, they can look that information up and instantly know what procedure that was used on and notify the patient if needed to get the item explanted in most cases and replaced for what needs to be uh, used in its substitution or if it just needs to be explained. But they can do that instantly as opposed to a process that sometimes used to take six months. Uh, if at all they could ever remember, you know, it was easy for them to get it off the shelf if they had it when they got a recall letter in the mail and they looked around and found something, but it was very difficult for them to know if it was used in a procedure because they had archaic billing records. They had very disorganized billing records. A lot of it, if you remember, if you've seen them in labs, they take the the barcode sticker that they come through for in some of these supplies, especially in the Cardiac Cap Lab, they took that sticker and they stuck it on the sheet uh, that they were using in the procedure. And then the nurse would file that procedure into billing. Billing would maybe record the information in regards to the lot number, the serial number, the item maybe into their uh, clinical documentation system. If not, somebody had to go back and look at, uh, at all these scanned uh, papers from six, seven months ago and find these items maybe. And if they did, they did. If they didn't, they did. But inevitably something was going to happen, unfortunately. And, and that liability is if something happens with regards to a failure of one of those recall items and you didn't proactively do something to get that fixed, the hospital is going to pay through something known as a lawsuit, uh, which they can avoid now by uh, proactively knowing whether they have affected lots or affected serial numbers for those items. Let's take a look at some predictive analysis and pandemic planning. Over the last 12 months, Loma Linda has remained steady for their value of on-hand inventory while their consumption values have outpaced their purchases in the last several months. And here is the COVID related world. March, more or less, when this first started, you can see in the gray is the number of cases. You saw the, the volume of cases was relatively steady in January, February, started its decline in March, went way down in April, hit the bottom of the floor in May, started to kick back up in June when they, when they started reopening California. July it went back up. August it started to put the brakes on it again in California, and the numbers started to dip back down. But the most important thing is the supply. Supply costs here went down in February. They went back up in March because they saw it coming, so they were able to predictively stock their supplies. And then since March, it followed the trend of the curve. It went way down in April. It hit the bottom of the floor in May started to gradually go back up in June, July, and level off in uh, August, which is where they are today. But their numbers, there was not a need to have lots and lots of stock on hand because they knew the number of procedures they were doing on an average basis. They were able to predict, let's increase our volume, but let's increase our stock by 25% in lieu of the pandemic. Let's do things that we can analyze. So they brought in an abundance of stock in March, as you see there, in case that they were going to be overwhelmed by procedures. Now, this is a cardiac cath lab. May not be the best example for COVID-related care, but we do uh, have had things with PPE and things like that. Uh, with them, when the numbers kind of reflect the same thing, mostly reflect the same thing. They brought in a larger number of stock with regards to that in, in uh, February. Uh, but it has gone in the same direction. But they can use the numbers to their benefit. And they use that stock. They didn't reorder more. They kept using the stock that they bulked up on in March. Got rid of that and leveled back off to where they are today, where they're pretty much level as far as they order supply as they need it or as they use it. Not, let's go have a supply room full of stuff in the event that we may need it. Six, from, six months from now, 12 months from now, whatever the case may be, controls their spending. If they're able to maximize their spending, they're able to use that capital for other things. They're able to 
divert their capital for cardiac supplies, since they have predictive analysis here, and they can divert some of that funding to stockpiling on PPE. They can divert some of that funding to stockpiling on staff uh, to bulk up, and which is what they did. They bulked up their, their PPE, they increased their staff hours, they increased their number of staff so that they wouldn't be overwhelmed with uh, patient care. Uh, luckily, they they have not been, uh, but they have been able to use their predictive analysis or their numbers to allow them to analyze or predictively understand what they needed as far as stock, what types of procedures they ran on, on, a, on a concurrent basis, and what they were going to need in the future for those types of cases. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, they, they said they had a they had a uh, online presentation next, so they wanted their their uh, time to log on to there. But I will be happy to take any questions. Uh, so it's all it's all in the numbers. Like I said, this used to be the most boring conversation in the room, but ever since the pandemic rolled around, it seems to be the most interesting conversation uh, in the room now. At least as far as I'm concerned, uh, they've, they've had a number of uh, inquiries for this type of uh, presentation.